generations to come. Welcome to another edition of the TDN Writers Room. My name is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the TDN and also the co-host of the Down the Stretch Radio Show on Sirius XM with Dave Johnson. Hey, I like that show. How y'all doing? I'm Randy Moss with uh, NBC Sports. Zoe Cabman, back from England. I'm with First Racing, and I think we're going to rename this show the Wake Up with Randy and Bill <laughs> as it's 6.30 a.m. Pacific time. Randy's got places to go, people to see, and babies to kiss, so we need to get this done. I'll see if I can't get them to put a little, something a little extra in your check. How about yeah, that, Zoe? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hey, you, look, you look pretty bright-eyed, given the time of day there. Uh, so. I'm over five. It's all right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, guys, a very slow weekend, and we're in that period between the Belmont Stakes and Saratoga. Not a whole heck of a lot goes on in the sport. So I pull my hair out in some of these weeks trying to come up with interesting topics. But I think among the three of us, we can grab a couple of topics and make some um, salient points and get people interested in the races. The biggest race over the weekend, clearly the Stephen Foster, the grade one at Churchill Downs. And it was run at Ellis Park last year, if you remember, when they had all the problems at Churchill. And I've always kind of, the winner of Kings Barnes, I've always kind of liked that horse. Ever since he won the Louisiana Derby, I thought like, you know, this is a horse that's really on the rise. Um, you know, could be a Kentucky Derby winner. We'll be hearing more about him. And he won a few little races afterwards, but for the most part, he didn't live up to expectations. I mean, he won the Ben Ali of grade three. So Pletcher threw him into the Stephen Foster and he looked like the horse I thought he always could be. Now, is he going to be the yeah, Clips Award winner, older male? I don't know about that. But I think that maybe he's finally broken through and ready to show the talent that he um, you know, teased us with when he was three. Zoe, what do you think? I think he's a good horse. I'm actually shocked that he went off at nine to one, to be perfectly honest. He's only finished worse than second once. That was in the Kentucky Derby. He's won six of nine. The rest of those have all been second. Like he's a really, really good horse. We've seen time and time again, the sons of Uncle Mo needing just a little bit more time to really get into their own. I thought he got a very enterprising ride from Louis Saez. Modest fractions. He was wide around the first turn and, and Louis moved him in time to get the jump. No excuse from what I saw from the favorite first mission who was up there on the pace in what tepid Fractions, 24, 48, and 2. If you can't win going those fractions at Churchill on that day, then you've got absolutely no excuse. So definitely an enterprising ride by Louis, and he's a good horse. And now maybe he'll get the credit he deserves for a horse who's only finished worse than second once, and that was in the Derby, and anybody can be excused for that. Yeah, I totally agree with everything you said. The reason why it was 9-1, to one, I mean, going into the Stephen Foster – the horses with the two highest buyer speed figures in the older horse division were Skippy Longstocking, 107 in the Oakland Handicap, and then First Mission, 106 on a sloppy track in the Ali Sheba. So they were the two favorites in the race, First Mission and then Skippy. But they had no excuse. Like you said, they were 1-2 in soft fractions all the way around. Uh, uh, Pyrenees uh, had beaten Kings Barnes on the up and up in the Pimlico Special. Very slow pace that day. Kings Barnes got about a two-length jump on Pyrenees at the top of the stretch. Pyrenees still ran him down, uh, but this time Kings Barnes was, uh, was solidly the best. I think the big thing about Kings Barnes and what he showed in the Stephen Foster, if you remember when he was a three-year-old, he was a front runner. Uh, he could get keen when they tried to raid him and take him off the pace, and now with maturity, he settles better off the pace, and that's going to make him a factor, I think, in these older horse races going forward. And who's in the older horse division, right? I mean, you've got Senor Buscador out there training at San Luis Ray Downs. Um, they gave him a month off after his, uh, after his Middle Eastern exploits. They were tentatively pointing him for the San Diego at Del Mar. Uh, late July at a mile and a 16th. He's only had three breezes, a couple three furlongs and a four furlong. He may not be ready for that. The Pat O'Brien at seven eights might be a backup target, but at least he's out there. National treasure, right? He could go in either the Whitney or the Pacific Classic in his next start. Uh, but in the Classic Division, probably National Treasure one, assuming that a mile and a quarter is okay with him. Um, and then Senor Buscador right after that. And other than that, it's wide open. And I see no reason why Kings Barnes couldn't at least be in the mix. 
Randy, I want to get back to uh, what you just said about national treasure. And, um, you know, I do the NTRA poll. I vote for him number one each week, which I think is deserved. But do you think Baffert would, is it automatic that he go in the classic? Wouldn't the mile distance fit him better? Well, I mean, his best races so far uh, have been at, at the shorter distances, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in the, in the uh, Pegasus World Cup at a mile and an eighth, he ran well with a, a very, very harsh pace. Uh, and he just has, in the Met Mile, I mean, he dominated. He's, he won the Preakness at a mile and three sixteenths with a, just an impossibly easy front-running trip. I think he's probably better at a two-turn mile or a one-turn mile than he would be at a mile and a quarter, but he's so sharp right now mm -hmm. that I think Baffert and the ownership group, Zoe, I don't know how you feel about this, but I think they feel compelled uh, to give him a shot at those longer distances and see if he can't make it to the Classic. Well, I mean, we'll find out because he's more than likely going to go to the Pacific Classic, right? It's a mile and a quarter. And let's face it, he's better than the rest. And he may not be brilliant at a mile and a quarter, but he's going to be better than the rest of them. So I think that's what we're looking at right now. Just a quick note on King's Barnes. Do you not think we should put an asterisk by all these horses that cost a lot of money and actually make up that purchase price? He cost 800000 as a two-year-old at the last Gulfstream sale. He's made $1.5 When does that ever happen? When does it ever happen? It rarely happens that a horse exceeds their purchase price. So he's been well handled well-managed, and we're going to hear a lot from him later on. Randy, what were some of the other stories out of Churchill Downs this weekend? Yeah, like Zoe can weigh in on some of these, too. There were a lot of really good races Saturday at Churchill Downs. The Fleur de Lee, Scylla, uh, lived up to expectations, was the Ooh. best horse in the race. What I thought was interesting there, there was a significant amount of trouble coming down the stretch. Uh, Chijira and Julian Leperu got the worst of it, claimed foul against two different horses, Scylla and a cult. This is Churchill Downs, the stewards. They did nothing. They punted <laughs> completely. You know, someone should have been disqualified, probably a cult from fourth, which is minor. Not as much of a slam dunk as the Kentucky Derby, but still. I mean, it was pretty significant trouble. Autumn and Fleet, Flavie and Pratt uh, seized a front-running trip in there, got aggressive early when there was no speed in the race. We talked to him about that last week. The seventh graded stakes win in the United States this year for Charlie Appleby, the 14th for Godolphin. And I thought this was interesting. We've talked a lot about Jason Worth and his ownership in Dornick, former baseball player. Well, there's another baseball player out there with a significant, uh, significant horse, Edwin Diaz, is the closer for the New York Mets. He's got a nickname that his Mets teammates gave him of Sugar uh, that he got because they saw him watching a movie titled Sugar, and he <laughs> looked a lot like the title character, so they started calling him Sugar. He embraces it. He's got a, 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 a necklace that says Sugar on it. He's a huge racehorse fan from Puerto Rico. He's good friends with Irad and Jose Ortiz, and he's now in racehorse ownership with a horse named Close the Game Sugar who won the Kelly's Landing at Churchill Downs on the Stephen Foster undercard. Uh, he had beaten Skelly, one of the best sprinters in the country before that. So Edwin Diaz, the closer for the Mets, is uh, right in the mix there with, uh, with former MLB pitcher or star Jason Worth uh, with a horse that could make some noise in the sprint division. Yeah, interesting topics there, and we'll keep an eye on that. So I wanted to go over to uh, Los Alamitos in the first race on Saturday. As I get a kick out of these kind of stories where, you know, we're so used to uh, the Bafferts winning and the Pletchers winning and the Chad Browns winning, Sea Bass Musin, et cetera. Matter of fact, it's a maiden race at uh, at Los Al, and Baffert had the, you know, like he always does, the killer first-time starter there, uh, named Privman, obviously named after our friend Jay Privman, the retired um, uh, racing rider for the Daily Racing Forum. But there was another horse in there by the name of uh, uh, Mischief Ride, and, um, excuse me, Mischief River. And I looked down, I was handicapping the race, and I was like, wait, the horse cost 500000 at OBS April, trained by Jimmy Glenn Jr., I kind of know most of the trainers in the country. He's like, who is this guy? I never heard of him. So lo and behold, it turns out that he is a quarter horse trainer. 
But he, him and one of the owners wanted to uh, take a little bit of a jump into the thoroughbreds, buy a couple horses, and just sort of have fun with them. He's not going to be the next Baffert or Lucas to change careers midstream. But, um, and they even rode, they rode a quarter horse jockey on the horse, Cesar Ortega, um, who rides the uh, nighttime cards at Los Al. And lo and behold, he won, beating Privman. I think um, Michael Rona had a, uh, during his call, had something like, and Privman's deadline is coming due, which was uh, something to that effect, which was pretty clever. But anyways, uh, you know, is is he the, he's going to run next in the best pal. Is he going to win the Del Mar Futurity and, and go on? Who knows? But it, it just, it was a fun story. I get so sick of writing about the same guys all the time. A really nice man. Uh, apparently he's very highly regarded in the quarter horse business. And let's see what this quarter horse guy can do with this horse. It's a great story. It really is. And I mean, this isn't just two guys dipping their toes in the water. It was Bow River Ranch as well, the other part of the ownership. That's 500000 They bought another horse at that sale as well. So that's hardly dipping. That's like plunging in the deep end. That's mm -hmm. a lot of money in anybody's book. I don't know if these guys are completely loaded. Uh, Jimmy's a very good quarter horse trainer. He's trained multiple Group 1 winners. But uh, you know, he's not the best of the best. I looked him up. He's won 736 quarter horse races. So he's not won 4,000 races or anything. His total thoroughbred uh, winning races is 54. And then I actually did a Randy and looked up some of the 54. The horse that won made 24,000. So if you look up his per start rage, ratio, even of all of his quarter horses he's ever run and his thoroughbreds, that's the highest ever, 24,000 in one start. So, I mean, this is not a dip your toes in the water kind of thing. I think these guys mean business and they're going to be here to stay. Because if you've got 500,000 to plonk down on one horse as your dip the toes investment, and what else have you got? Oh, by the way, he's apparently pretty good in jiu-jitsu too. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. If you look him up, you find lots of pictures of him doing jiu-jitsu. So just want to throw that out there. Uh... Do not get into a fight with Jimmy Glenn. <laughs> Now that, that's a rabbit hole. I'm proud of you. That's, that's pretty cool. It gives us another rooting interest, right? I mean, the horse gets a 71 buyer speed figure. He's obviously going to have to improve a whole heck of a lot. But, hey, uh, he's in the mix with some uh, with some new faces. What what better race to ride a quarter horse jockey in, though, than a two-year-old sprint? He's right. probably pretty good at the hook races, the 870 races. Yep. So, you know, just I go, 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 right. go with two-year-olds, and uh, he got it done. I actually think that's his I think that's his specialty, fair. the thoroughbred races at night, the what they call the ones around the hook, the, the 870 hook. races. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Privman, to be fair, got carried out in that turn. He was probably 15 wide turning for home because the horse to the inside of him just carried him out. And Mischief River, who'd already been on the lead, then he already sat second, then he was fourth and going nowhere around the turn, just came up the inside. And it was a terrible race, to be perfectly honest, but galloped home in front. So All we right. got a 71 with a dream trip, you're saying? Okay. All right. Yeah, Randy. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll keep an eye on him. Even if he did just run a 71 buyer, I'm not going to give up on this horse. I'd love to see him become one of the big two-year-olds of the year. But um, that's what we got for now. We're going to go uh, after this break, and we're going to talk about the Green Group Guest of the Week. Do you want to remind you that the TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Where will I be on September the 9th? Well, I'll be shopping book one at Keeneland September. Why? Just ask Mike Ryan. If you're trying to buy top quality horses that have real stallion and broodmare potential when their racing careers are done, book one is where you're going to start. I should have really done that in an Irish accent, but my Irish brogue is not that good. I do want to remind you that the September sale runs from September the 9th to the 21st, and we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the management and staff of Keeneland, I would like to welcome you to the September yearling sale. Good to have you back with us. The energy at Keeneland Book One is unlike any other sale that you'll go to. It is the marketplace. Yeah, the center of the, of the horse universe. It's electric. You can't replicate the urgency that's at Keeneland September. Quality in quantity. Keeneland September Book One, every breeder's dream. And now this week's Fastest Horse of the Week is brought to you again by Constitution, one of the fast sires at One Star Farm. Constitution's son, the three-year-old Neat, 
won his second graded stakes race. It was on Saturday at Belmont at Aqueduct. The $250,000 grade three Manila. Neat is a pretty neat horse. He's a really hard trying sort. And he added the Manila to his win earlier in the Transylvania stakes at Keeneland, also a grade three. With that, Constitution now ranks second among North American sires of graded stakes winning three-year-olds. The future is now. Constitution stands for $110,000 at Windstar Farm. Now, the fastest horse of the week ran also at Belmont at Aqueduct. Instead of Saturday, he ran on Friday. Instead of a grade three stakes, he ran in an allowance race. His name is Subrogate. He is a four-year-old colt by Arrowgate, owned by Richard Santulli, the Colt's Neck Stables, LLC, trained by Jorge Duarte. Won an allowance race at six and a half furlongs by six lengths with a buyer speed figure of 106. Subrogate was a highly touted three-year-old. They put him in the Pegasus Stakes against Salute the Stars in Kings Barnes and only his third lifetime start last year. He finished a solid fourth. After that, he got hurt. So since he's come back as a four-year-old, he's now a perfect three for three. And Subrogate with that 106 buyer, our fastest horse of the week. Now, one of the highlights of our podcast every week, the Green Group Guest of the Week gives an opportunity for you to hear from somebody else besides Bill and Zoe and me. The Green Group Guest of the Week, of course, brought to you by The Green Group, a tax consulting and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. Welcome in now, The Green Group Guest of the Week. It is the general manager of Spendthrift Farms, Mr. Ned Toffey, a proud New Englander, and uh, has had a very good weekend for his stable. And uh, Ned, coming into the Stephen Foster Looked to me like Kings Barnes was a little bit of an underachiever. He had won the Louisiana Derby so nicely. And this, mm-hmm. you know, after that, he was okay here, okay there, grade three races. Was this the real Kings Barnes? Is this the horse that you were hoping for all along, the one that showed up in the grade one? Well, I sure hope so. I mean, this is what we were really excited about going into the Derby. I, I actually went back and was watching, watched every race in his career and, you know, his his early races down at Gulfstream were, were so impressive. And, you know, it was sort of a funny pace. You know, the Louisiana Derby he caught a slow pace. He went he went to the to the lead and nobody challenged him. And he sort of walked off with that race um, and got caught up in a crazy speed duel in the Derby. And I just uh, you know, there was going to be no shot in there. Um, got started to get into some ticky tacky sound of stuff. So we gave him. Gave him a lot of time off, and and I think it did him good. And we've started to see, um, you know, what we saw before. But I I think the thing that got everybody down on him, and honestly had me a little down on him, was uh, <clears throat> the Pimlico special. He sort of had no excuse there. Um, you know, he sat right right there on a on a very very slow pace. And I and I think as Todd I saw put it the other day, you know, I think Louis learned something about that race, and I think. I think that was sort of the equine equivalent of, of of letting your opponent hang around rather than just putting him away. And and Pyrenees is a very, very nice horse. But, you know, if you go back and you watch that race, Louis didn't really push the button until they straightened away. And if you go back and look at the Stephen Foster, he pushed the button at the three eights pole. The horse really responded and sustained that run all the way around. So I think I think it was a matter of getting the jump on Pyrenees instead of letting him get in the jump on us. But this horse with a lot of a lot of stamina, really good tactical speed, and and um, but he can he can sustain a run, and so uh, I, I think things set up better for him. And Louis rode a great race, so I, hopefully that's what we see going forward. So Ned, you initially bought Kings Barnes uh, in a two-year-old in training sale off of a very fast quarter-mile breeze for eight hundred thousand dollars. Now he's made a million five. Yeah. But as we all know, Spinthrift is primarily in the business of standing stallions. I think you got twenty-seven, yeah. is what I counted on your website right now. We have, we, have, we have twenty-seven. I will tell you, if you go back to the original Spinthrift, we found as many as forty-six. So. We're we're really? we're uh, we're underachieving maybe right now ourselves. So. so what does the win mean? Grade one, Stephen Foster, son of Uncle Mo, right out of a tappet mare, uh, for yeah. the future of Kings Barns in a stallion barn. 
Well, it means we can order him a, na- a, a stall plate, uh, a nameplate for his stall in the in the stallion barn. He he's you know he's earned a spot. The great thing was we got a lot of calls from a lot of breeders saying, uh, "Save me a couple spots to King's Barn." So you know I think they they they've seen him enough around that they they know what kind of physical he is, and and I think it's really helpful in marketing a stallion to have one on the Derby Trail. There there's there, you, it, you almost can't pay for all that publicity that you get. Um, <clears throat> and for him to now kind of keep his name around this year and kind of start to reestablish w- what he is, um, he, he's, uh, he should be a very marketable horse for us. Do you think that's really helped him, the longevity? People being like, oh, gosh, I, I remember that one because he ran in the Derby and now, oh, well, he's obviously sound because he's still here. Yeah, I, you know, I think so. I think soundness is probably a little underrated among among breeders and among all of us in terms of its importance. But, um, you know, when when you do, it, it's one more added thing for us to sell. But he's, you know, what people are looking for, first and foremost, is talent and probably precocity is a is a is a is a close second. Um, th- this guy showed enough of of, of those things. But to extend it and, and, and win at a, at a high level um, the way he did Saturday and hopefully the way he'll continue to do, um, you know, it, it, it certainly means a lot. Ned, let's change course for a minute and talk about another horse in your barn. Tuscan Sky is pointing for the uh, Haskell. Uh, and other horse had an interesting career. He looked like he was going to be uh, have a really nice career, ran a very poor race in the Wood Memorial, and then came back to win the prep, the uh, Pegasus Stakes for the Haskell. Um, is he up to the task, or does he have to improve a few lengths to be able to Well, I, I certainly play? think he's got to um, improve a few lengths, but – you know, if you looked at the numbers going into the Stephen Foster, I thought Kings Barnes had to improve a few lengths, and and, and he did. So um, I, I think he does. But he, you know, this horse is um, we still don't really quite know what we have. The the as you said, I mean, the Wood Memorial really left us scratching our heads. We sort of thought he was this year's Kings Barnes. He was going, he was two for two going into the Wood Memorial. Uh, we were hoping for a big performance there to, to springboard us into the Derby. Um, and, um, you know, just just didn't it just wasn't there, you know, for for whatever reason. Um, but he's he's bounced back. Um, he, he's a, he's always been a good workhorse. He, he tends to finish off his works really well, gallop out really well. And, and we're starting to see that from him again. Um, and so, you know, we'll be we'll be we'll be as eager to see what, what he can do um, as, as everybody else is. I wish, I wish we knew, but um, I think we're going to find out along with everyone else, but you know, he, he ran a great race on that track. Um, So you know, very tempting to go back the way things are starting to unfold. You'd have to almost look, look at the Jim Dandy, but again, for our, for our, you know, for our, our model, the, the grade one uh, being right there is, is very tempting because that, that, you know, very nearly earns you a spot um, in, in the stud barn. Having, having said that, I think the Jim Dandy is is one of those races that it, it's it's a grade two, you know, obviously not a grade one, but maybe it's more like a grade 1.5 because I think it carries carries a little more weight among breeders um, than than your typical grade two. So it, it, it's something that, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye on, but um you know, with door knock going there, it, it sort of, you know, I don't know that the pace scenario is that much different. It's just going to be more crowded on the front end. So, um, but, you know, we'll see. We've, we've got option, but nice horse. We're hoping that he can move forward for us. So, Ned, there's so many things we could talk to you about, about Spinthrift, right? The amazing into mischief, the up, up and coming Vacoma, some other racehorses and all that. But we're all history buffs. So I kind of <laughs> want to I kind of want to start there, right? Okay. Spindrift began in the 1930s with Leslie Combs. Um, mm-hmm. You and I both, I think, made our first trips to a Kentucky breeding farm at Spindrift Farm. I went in That's the early right. 1980s. I mean, they've stood Nashua, Majestic Prince, Seattle Slough, Affirmed. And then it fell into disrepair, went into bankruptcy, uh, uh, foreclosure sales, Enter B. Wayne Hughes in 2004, who hired you right on the spot. What has B. Wayne Hughes meant to the history of Spendthrift Farm? 
<laughs> well, fortunately, he's meant another really, really meaningful chapter in 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 a great, great history. And I, I agree with you, guys. I'm, I'm a I'm a history buff too, so I, I I love. I think it's one of the great lures for me to this game. Is it, it is such a neat history, um, and so it's been really a, a cool thing for me to be a part of trying to rebuild. You know what what was here, um, but it it was really it's it was it was Wayne's vision. Um, having said that, Wayne would tell you, I mean, we sort of backed into this. Wayne wanted a place for his grandkids to maybe get out of Malibu and, and kind of be, be country kids a little bit like he was growing up in Oklahoma. Um, and then there was a point at which he said, well, we've got this really great stallion complex. I guess we ought to use it. Um, you know, we started with one $5,000 stallion named Teton Forest um, and kind of, you know, took off from there. But but, you know, Wayne, I think over the the early years that he was here, really developed a, a deeper and deeper appreciation for the history and, and for the legacy of Spendthrift and, and really begin to, began to think about that a lot. But, you know, he loved the business exercise of identifying the stallions, of going out and acquiring them, marketing them, putting together a team to, to, to sell uh, these horses. And, and, and so it was a great experience for him and something that came along at a good time in his life. But without his vision, uh, without his love for the game. And I think one of the things that that separated Wayne from a lot of people was I think he always felt like he had a responsibility, uh, a a willingness to help, you know, float all boats. You know, they say rising tide floats all boats. Well, that's that was very important to Wayne. He he wanted to see the industry do well. He did. He did a lot of things um, that that were about helping the industry, not just Wayne. Uh, I remember years back. This goes back a little bit, even just before Spencer. But he had um, a horse named That's what I'm talking about that ran in the in the Derby, and um, he let uh, Steven Spielberg buy in to that horse. Um, and he said to me, "Look, I know if if he wins, the headline's going to be Spielberg wins the Derby." And he only had a small percentage of the horse. But to, to Wayne, that was a great thing for racing. And and so he was more than happy to do it. The, the, the funny story, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll sidetrack a little bit because it's a great Wayne story. But he said that um, uh, Steven Spielberg showed up with a, a contract uh, for the purchase of his percentage of that horse that was about the size of a uh, probably an L.A. area phone book, if people still remember. <laughs> books are. And uh, Wayne tore the back page off of it, turned it over, found the blank part and said, you agree to buy the X percentage. You are responsible for these bills. I'm responsible for this. He signed it and drew a line for, for him to sign. And he did. So Wayne boiled it, boiled, uh, you know, hundreds of pages down to one page. And that was that was Wayne in a nutshell. But again, that was important to Wayne. That was going to help the industry. And it was the same thing with with the my racehorse stuff that he did and and with the way we've structured our our incentive programs here at Spencer. So I think it's his vision and recognizing that it's not just about um, the high end of the market and the blue the blue bloods and so on that that as he liked to say breeders are the backbone of the industry and we and not just the high end. And so we've you know our our 27 stallion roster right now really spans um, the entire spectrum of, of, of all of the levels of the market. And, and that was always really important to Wayne and continues to be important to us. So, you know, it really were, I think we're all really, really fortunate and, um, that he came along and, and bought Spendthrift when he did. And, and, and it's been fun to watch breeders recognize it and, and just, Average Lexingtonians that that are familiar with Spencer. It's a name they all knew, whether they were in the horse business or not. And we've had so many people come up to Wayne or myself and 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 um, and, and and say, you know, thank you for what what you've what you've done here. And of course, Tammy and Eric are, are just continue continuing that that legacy on beautifully. So it's it's been a great thing to be a part of. And I think one of the biggest things, especially for me, watching Spendthrip basically grow up through my career and watching those famed colors of Spendthrip was not only into mischief because he really only came 
to flower when he went to stud, to be perfectly honest, but it, it was watching Beholder. And anyone that talks about Spendthrift knows about Beholder. What has she meant to the legacy of Spendthrift? And I, I'm sure B. Wayne looks down on her every day because she was absolutely <laughs> his favorite number one, having watched him interact with her when he came to Southern California. Yeah. Um, yeah, she was pretty special. And that was really, you know, Wayne had had some other very, very nice horses, but um, she was an, uh, she was a big horse for anybody. And she really was truly exceptional. Um, and the fact that she was a grade one winner from age two all the way through age six, went in a grade one every year, and she just sustained this great level of excellence, which is a credit to her and a credit to Wayne and a credit to Richard Mandela. Um, but, you know, she, she's really meant a lot. I think it helped it helped kind of reestablish our name one because we were already here at Spendthrift by then and um, you know, met a lot for the tourism side of things. She's very popular on the tours. And um, um, but, yeah, it's, it, it, it's meant the world to us. And to have her come here and now prove herself as a broodmare with two graded stakes winners and one being a grade one winner. Um, she's she's um, you know, she's really all you could ever ask for as a, as a as an owner somebody racing, somebody breeding. She's, she's, she's really done it all. It's pretty, really amazing. Finally, finally, how special was it when that first one broke through after a, a couple of, you know, nice jump horses, <laughs> should we say, nice show horses that, that you have? The QB1 is a, is a very happy show horse in Virginia <laughs> now. So, um, so I'm, I'm glad he's, he's uh, found himself, so to speak. But uh, um yeah, no, it was it, it was it was um, it was very gratifying with Tina Ella first winning a, a grade three and then Tamara, you know, in quick succession came along and established herself. And, and uh, you know, it's 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 very nice, too, because, you know, sometimes you, you get a little you can get a little bit of a complex. So what, what are we doing? What are we doing wrong here? These surely these ought to be able to run. And and uh, so it's 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 nice that they've that they've been able to do that now. And uh um, you know, and those will, uh, Tina Ella has already joined the, the broodmare band here and Tamara has got a little unfinished business. So, um, we'll, um, see what she can do. Where's she going? We'll see. She's, you know, Richard had started back. He was, he was originally pointing to the, to the test, um, a few little, just ticky tacky issues, nothing major, but he's just had to back off on her training. So I think we probably won't see her till, till after Del Mar. But I, we do very much expect to see her uh, at some point late this year. And, you know, that'll that'll leave us a decision for what she does next year. But, um, you know, and I suspect she'll she'll tell us. But, um, you know, we're still very excited about about her future. Ned, the dream of any stud farm is to find the next great sire. You did it with Into Mischief. I'm not going to say that Vacoma is going to be the next Into Mischief because that's rarefied air, but yeah. you've got the hottest two-year-old stallion in the business out there. He's number one in winners and number two in money earned, and he stands for only $15,000. Mm -hmm. um, did you see this coming, or is this obviously must have exceeded your expectations? Yeah, I'd love to tell you we knew it all along and that, that he was going to be a great horse, but that would be, uh, that would be, a, be a, a tremendous stretch. Look, I, I think like a lot of our horses, we, we, we bring horses here that we think have got a chance to be successful. Um, to be successful, you've got to get mares to these horses. You've got to give them an opportunity. And and so and that's really uh, you know drives our thinking on price point. A lot of these horses, he's, he started at 20 and, and he's, you know, most horses have got to, you know, back down a little bit until they're proven one way or another. Um but, you know, very quickly, we did hear very good things. We, we, we heard great things about his foals. Uh, we try to get out and see as many of his foals uh, around town here as we can. Um, when they went to the yearling sale, we really started hearing a lot of superlatives from people. Um, one of the comments that always jumped out at me, he said, uh, 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 it was a two-year-old pinnacler, but he said to me that these, the Vacomas just move differently. And, and that one always sort of stuck out with me. But we heard a lot of awfully good things. And so, um, and again, it's a great sire line. It's, it's, you know, Candy Ride is really, you know, starting to look like a sire, a real sire of sires. And, and so um, not altogether surprising, but 
you know, when one, this is such a tough game and, and there is frankly so much failure inherent. So you're probably always a little surprised when any of them work out. Um, and look, he's got, he's got a ways to go. He's gotten off to a great, great start. Um, you know, we had a horse named Warriors Reward a number of years ago. He started off eight for his first eight um, and and then just didn't continue on from there. So, look, he's got to continue on. It's a long time till till next breeding season. So, you know, wh- what price point he'll be at next year? Um, you know, he, he's got a lot more to do to determine mm-hmm. you know, what exactly what that'll be. But we, we sure are. We sure are excited and grateful. And it's a credit to our breeders. Um, but this is a horse who really hasn't missed a beat. You know, a lot of horses have some smaller books after year one, but he's been popular really from year one right on through. And I think a lot of that is because of the price point. One more question for me, Ned. I, I, I find this just absolutely astounding almost. I was familiar with the Philly Leslie's Lady as a racehorse, Jim Hines, Bob Holthus. She was okay. She wasn't a great racehorse by any stretch of the imagination. They breed her to Harlan's Holiday. Okay, he's an okay stallion. He's not a super fashionable stallion. And you get a yearling that you guys buy for just $180,000, and it turns out to be into mischief. Okay? Now, her next couple of foals don't even make it to the races. One more can't run much. Now, you go back to a yearling sale, and you spend another $180,000 to get beholder. (laughs) Who makes six million? Then yeah. Mendelssohn comes later. But I know you were involved. I hear with the purchases of both Into Mischief and Beholder. Can you tell us a little well, story about some of those? I, I was here. I was here then. I would, and I would love to take credit for them both. But I would say the common denominator is a guy named Seth Simpkin, who who has worked for Wayne. I think he's the only guy in the program uh, longer than me. He's been with. Wayne for for years and years now. I've been with him for twenty years, and Seth has been longer. So um, Seth and Richard were at the uh, March OBS sale and picked out into mischief actually as a, at a two year old training sale and and paid one hundred eighty thousand dollars for him. I was in the organization, and I still remember I didn't go to that sale because we'd had an outbreak uh, of a, uh, a problem with our foals. There was a uh, a, a bad uh, full diarrhea outbreak, and we were sort of in crisis mode here, and so I actually stayed here. So, so um, uh, at that time, into mischief shipped up, and he he first laid up for thirty days in our stallion barn, which I guess was maybe sort of foreshadowing that uh, back then our stallion barn did, wasn't occupied with st- other stallions, and we used it to to for layups, but. Uh, um, and, and then Beholder, I was, yes, I was part of the buying team when we bought Beholder um, as as a yearling. And, you know, knowing that Into Mischief was, yes, he was a grade one winner at two, but knowing that he was, his race record didn't really indicate how good he really was, um, that made Beholder, also Beholder's an exceptional physical, um, but also knowing that her, her half sibling was even better than what his lone grade one at two showed um that was that was an easy one i think we broke a few pin hookers hearts because she being by henny hughes you know i think they thought this was going to be right up their alley and i remember when we walked up to bid on her one two-year-old uh pin hooker looking at us sort of disgustedly saying what are you doing here so <laughs> um and he and he walked off at that point but so we were able to get her bought yeah for the exact same price um, Wayne, I think it might be the highest I ever saw Wayne bid at auction when we tried to buy, um, <clears throat> uh, the next one. I'm drawing a blank on, uh, Mendelssohn. On, 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 thank you. On Mendelssohn. Yeah. And, and I think, I think we bid 2.9 and, and Kumar bid 3 million and Wayne was kicking himself, said, I should have kept going. And I, I said, I think if you'd bid 3.9, they'd have bid 4 million. So it, it or 4.9, they'd have bid five. So they were determined uh, to have him as well. And he was, he was a beautiful, he was a beautiful yearling as well. So we've been very fortunate. We've been able to buy the, 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 the right ones out of that mare and, and, and avoid some of the others that haven't, haven't panned out. But, uh, yeah, it's a remarkable mare. And it just, it shows what, you know, Wayne had a great expression about the horse business. Nobody knows. And, that mare's a great example. Who who would have known looking at her early in her year that 
she was going to have the influence on the breed that 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 she's had. So um, it's, it's that's one of the things I think that makes this game this game so great. Well, Ned, thanks so much for joining us on this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room podcast, and we'll be looking forward to see how Tuscan Sky can do in the uh, Haskell, and also looking forward to what Kings Barnes can do for the rest of the year. Got a lot of exciting things coming up at Spendthrift. Once again, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you for having me. Cheers, Ned. As our Green Group Guest of the Week, Spinthrift Farms, Ned Toffee will receive a free one-hour tax consultation from Lynn Green et al. at the Green Group. For more information on how the Green Group can save you money when it comes to tax time, log on to greenco.com. When it comes to the horse industry, tax laws are complicated and unique. That is why most people overpay on their taxes. Why not get a second opinion from the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred industry? With over 800 clients in the horse business alone, the Green Group has the expertise to save you taxes. There is a reason the most successful owners, breeders, trainers, vets, and horsemen use the Green Group as their tax advisors. We save you taxes. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with current edge tax-saving strategies, produces positive tax-saving results for clients. Take advantage of this special offer. The Green Group will give you a complimentary and confidential review of your tax return. Contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The state of Pennsylvania has the best breeders program in the entire United States. When you buy a yearling, it's a little bit like buying a lottery ticket. And we are trying to provide a lottery ticket that the likelihood is to hit the jackpot. Angel of Empire wins the Arkansas Derby and wins it clear. Uncle Heavy late, it's a photo finish. Pennsylvania and the PHBA have the best state bred program in the country, bar none. The winner, Uncle Heavy, he's a three-year-old bred in Pennsylvania. The TD and Writers Room also brought to you by the PHBA, the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Uh, on August 26th at Parks, it's a day of racing called Pennsylvania Day at the Races. Four stakes races that day, each worth $100,000. The whole day is for Pennsylvania breads. One of those four races is for PA sired PA breads. Reason I'm telling you this, the nominations close Monday, July the 8th. So please forward or call in your nominations to the Parks Racing Office. And if you have any questions about that day in particular or about PA bread racing in general, you can call the PHPA office. That number, as you can see, 610-444-1050. You know, a lot of racing writers, a lot of racing fans, a lot of people in the profession really like to knock Churchill Downs. They're kind of becoming kind of everybody's whipping boy. And the reasons why are, you know, they, they're they bottom line oriented. Um, they they That's what they care about more so than anything else, their stock price. They closed Calder. That was a big to do. They closed Hollywood Park. They closed Arlington. And so you, know, you look at this company and say, well, they're not good for horse racing. But I'll tell you one thing. Let's put that aside. The, the, they deserve so much credit for what they've done with the Kentucky Derby. You think this race can't get any bigger. And every year there's a new construction project. And every year there's a new wrinkle and this and that. So the for the spring meet at Churchill, which just concluded, they handled seven uh, seven hundred eight point three million dollars over a forty three day meet. They broke the prior record by ninety three point five million dollars, giving away one point four million a day in purses and on average, good field sizes, eight point two horses per race. And you know what they're good at making money, and that's really what a business wants to do. But the Work that they've done, and Randy, I think you were talking about how impressed you were this year at the Derby about some of the, the you new know, paddock and the things they're doing. And they don't rest on their laurels, that's for sure. Um, yeah, sure, I wish they kept Arlington Park open, but you know, when it comes to America's greatest horse race, they are a wonderful steward for it because they just do everything right. 
Yeah, Arlington Park is a whole different ball of wax. It's a whole different topic. Uh, CDI deserves uh, a lot of credit for what they've done with the Kentucky Derby and the entire spring meet in general. And what a difference a year makes, right? Go back a year ago and you had the horse death situation at Churchill. They had to end the meet early and transfer it to Ellis Park. There was, you know, all this negativity about CDI and Churchill Downs racing. And now, you know, they not only bounced back in 2024, but they bounced back in record setting fashion, strong fields of horses, uh, you know, just really, really strong meeting at Churchill Downs. And they deserve a lot of credit. And the fact that you mentioned last year with Churchill and the horse deaths, it just goes to show you what a short memory horse racing has. Mm -hmm. Because I guarantee you, you could ask 10 different people and they're like, oh, was that last year? That seems like five years ago. Because it does. Horse racing has an incredibly short memory, which can be a good thing and also a bad thing. But in this case, it's a, it's a very, very good thing. And I actually have not been to Churchill yet. I've just seen it on the TV and it does look fan friendly and it looks fabulous. Now you're going to have to pay if you're going to go on any of the premier days, which is, you know, you have to pay anywhere you go. But as far as the handle, it's, it's just staggering. So I looked at the figures, 708.3 million. Now, Derby Day itself handled 320 million. So if you take that out of the 708 for, a, it was a 43 day meet. If you make it 42 and take the Derby Day out of the equation, that's a staggering $9.2 million a day for 42 days with field sizes of 8.2. So if anybody thinks that purses don't matter, they gave away $58 million in purses over the 43 day meet. And that's what you get. You get terrific handle and full fields. And we're going to talk about small fields a little bit later on with what's going on in Maryland. But I mean, money talks. And yes, kudos to Churchill. They've done a great job. That's a staggering amount of money wagered on each and every day. And Zoe, as you mentioned, it's a staggering amount of purses averaging 1.4 million a day. And these historical horse racing machines, boy, have they helped Kentucky racing and just take off. I, and again, I don't get it. I don't even understand the things. I wouldn't put five cents into one of these machines. <laughs> doesn't matter. These people are playing these things hand over fist. And it's not just um, Churchill. I, I mean, um, this is what makes Kentucky Downs roll. To, uh, it's helped Keeneland's purses, helps Ellis Park's purses. But, you know, you look up an, an allowance race is $140,000. You know, it's not hard to get good fields when you have a hundred and forty thousand dollar allowance race. But again, you know, I, I just wanted to kind of give them their credit where credit was due because what they've done with the Derby in the spring meet is really, really good. Well, one of the major stories off track last week was the move by the Supreme Court to essentially kick the can down the road on one of the Heise cases. And here's uh, all the, the machinations and here's all the processes, et cetera. Uh, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, took on the Heise case so far as unconstitutionality. And um, the Sixth Circuit ruled in favor of Heise is, is constitutional. The plaintiffs in that case then tried to appeal to the Supreme Court, and they were denied what's called a writ of certiori, which means basically that the Supreme Court says, we're okay with this, we're not interested in reviewing your case, let's move on. Now, it's not quite that simple because there's still another case out in the Fifth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, it's been sitting around for about six months. Everybody uh, doesn't quite understand why it's taking so long, but it's a very conservative court. And the question now is, will the Supreme Court's decision to basically say, we're not interested in looking at this, will that affect the Fifth Circuit? And they say, well, if the Supreme Court isn't uh, is an anti high so really what's the point of us ruling against it? I don't really know how that's all going to work, but we're moving closer to the day, of course, when we finally get all this legal stuff uh, turned around. But I, I guess... Um, you know, the, the anti-HISA forces are still going to wait for the decision happens on the, on the Sixth Circuit. But basically, I, after the Supreme Court decision came out, I, I mean, they're really, they're 50 to one to win this now. Um, isn't it time for them to just throw in the towel and work with the industry to make the whole situation better for everybody? Well, <clears throat> uh, TDN's favorite constitutional law expert, Lucinda Finley, had a great Q&A 
uh, in the TDN this week. And as she points out, uh, because the Supreme Court, uh, just because the Supreme Court uh, took a pass this past week on uh, on discussing the constitutionality of HISA, uh, doesn't mean that they might not accept a look at it in the future. And as Lucinda Finley mentioned, um, one of the Supreme Court's, uh, for lack of a better phrase, pet projects is to rule on things that two different districts disagree on when it comes to constitutionality. So one district court has ruled that HISA is constitutional. If this next ruling that we're awaiting from the conservative court rules that HISA is unconstitutional, then you have those conflicting rulings. And Lucinda Finley points out that's when the Supreme Court seems to be um, a little bit more likely to jump into the fray and decide the constitutionality between uh, those two differing rulings. So we might see the Supreme Court take up HISA um, a little bit later. So we may not be hearing the end of that. Yeah, Randy, I totally agree with what you said, but I just wonder, and again, not being a lawyer, a lot of this uh, being a, a journalist that doesn't specialize in this sort of stuff, it's a lot of guesswork. But I read into this that the Supreme Court sort of tipped their hand. If the Fifth Circuit uh, rules that it's unconstitutional by by denying the appeal or to hear an appeal from the other court, at least show me that the Supreme Court justices didn't think this was important enough to take up the case. And, um, you know, I don't know if they have already made up their minds, but this is certainly makes it look like that perhaps they are going to rule that it's if it all comes down to it, they're going to rule that it is constitutional. So yeah. uh, I think, you know, look, again, this is so complicated. It's taken so long to get through this and we're not through it yet. But I think for HISA, the pro HISA forces, this this was a good development. Yeah, I, I don't know how much of a deep dive the Supreme Court did on HISA. Uh, it's possible, I think, uh, you know, we've we've. We discussed last week about uh, <clears throat> was it the fifth the fifth district court that we're waiting on the hearing, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Fifth, yeah fifth, we fifth we court. we discussed that they possibly could be dragging their feet, waiting to see what the Supreme Court mm -hmm. did. I think it's also feasible that the Supreme Court looked at this, knowing that the Fifth Circuit is still ruling is still out there. The Supreme Court said, uh, wh "Why do we need to get in this now?" Right. We got a lot on our docket. Let's right. just see what the fifth what the fifth rules. And if there's a discrepancy, then we'll get into it and we'll dive into HISA and we'll see about the constitutionality. I don't know. Yeah. As they but say, stay tuned. The Supreme Court guys are looking down on this and going, oh, those horse racing people again. <laughs> Why can't these idiots figure it out between themselves? We tried to please them. Now they don't want it. Now they're fighting. Why don't we just put Eric and um, uh, what's the name in a room and just have them hash it out? <laughs> yeah. And, and there was another that. very, very interesting point that Lucinda Finley made. And I know if, if there may be some people out there that read about the most recent Supreme Court ruling, which was very controversial, basically overturning what's known as the Chevron uh, doctrine. All right? right. It's from a much earlier uh, case involving Chevron. And what basically the Supreme Court was saying in their ruling is that uh, the deep state, you could call it the uh, administrative state, right, is become too powerful. And that there has been too much administrative overreach from from some of these places. And the FTC was specifically mentioned among many of the agencies that the Supreme Court believed had were too powerful since they're unelected. And when I saw that, FTC, HISA, I thought, oh, oh, this this might be a problem. But Lucinda Finley says that it really is not a problem at all, in her opinion. So if anybody out there is curious about the Chevron doctrine and the Supreme Court overturning it, how that might impact HISA, uh, maybe not quite as much as, as some of us might fear. And you Lucinda should read Finley. it. To it's a good article. It, she explains it very well in layman's terms, which even made me understand it, which is hard <laughs> to do at this point. Um, is Lucinda your sister? 
Lucinda is my older sister, and she's much, much smarter than she's, I am. <laughs> she's very smart. She <laughs> is very, she is, she very is, smart. Yeah, she is really on the ball. She graduated high school in three years and then went to Columbia for undergrad and Columbia Law School. So, um, you know, that <laughs> speaks well enough for her as it is. So. Wow. But, uh, yeah, and, and I agree, Zoe. She does a great job of of, of putting this in, into common language that that everybody can understand. So thank you, sis. Should we talk about, briefly about what the HBPA did as well, just in the last few days? The HBPA has, has filed a petition uh, with the FTC, of course, basically the parent company of HISA, asking for no effect testing thresholds, right? Now, I'm, you know, I'm not a big supporter of the HBPA as it pertains to medication, well, we've all talked about that, how, you know, lax and lenient the HBPA tends to be about medication. But in this particular situation, I think they have a great point. Makes I mean, sense. Yeah, they're they're talking about, you know, all these these minute traces of either permissive medications or naturally occurring drugs that can have no impact whatsoever on the outcome of a horse race. And yet the sport of horse racing is smeared in the media uh, trainers' livelihoods are upended. Uh, and so the, the HBPA is just asking, can we get some common sense in here and have a threshold for these drugs where these, you know, picograms of overages and stuff just don't matter? And, and maybe they, they would result in disqualifications, but they wouldn't result in, in mm -hmm. penalties for the horsemen involved. I, I think it's a, it's a, it's an admirable idea that the HBPA has put up and, and maybe the HBPA and, uh, and HISA and HIWU and the FTC can, can come to some sort of arrangement here. Randy, I think that's an excellent idea, but you know, sometimes one of the frustrations in this game, you said it's just common sense. There's a lot of things in horse racing where if you put common sense into the equation, they would be different. Horse racing is not good at using common sense. So, um, but, but certainly the HBPA, uh, make, makes a good point on that. And, uh, you know, we're all hearing about the, uh, you know, guy with one picogram and of something or other, and then he's got a uh, six month suspension, which is, does sound a little bit ridiculous. The TD and Riders Zoom brought to you by the KTOB, the Kentucky Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders, Stephen Foster winner, Kings Barnes, of course, bred in Kentucky, grade one winners are bred in Kentucky. The Breeder Parks Investment Group, LLC, earned a $7,500 Kentucky Breeders Incentive Fund Award for breeding a grade one winner. You can learn more about all this by going to KentuckyBreads.com. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breds, breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. Well, this past weekend at Monmouth Park, the Boiling Spring Stakes to be run on Sunday did not fill. They didn't have enough horses. Uh, Monday at Parks, they had uh, one five-horse race and two four-horse races. Laurel last week, the feature race was an allowance race with three horses. And this is something I've been talking about, beating my head against the wall uh, for, for years. But, you know, everybody has complained so much about the shortage of horses available, the small fields. And it's obviously it's very bad for the game. Um, you know, people don't want to bet on four horse races with a one to five favorite and a second choice at six to five. But there's something that racing used to do was quite uh, frequent that they've totally gotten away from. And I think if they get back to it, it could solve a lot of the problems. And what I'm talking about is circuits. And when I first started going to the racetrack when I was a wee kid, there was a circuit of Delaware Park, Pimlico, Laurel, and Bowie. And then, so when Delaware Park ran, even though it was in a different state, the Maryland tracks would shut down. Uh, more recently, when Colonial Downs first opened, the Maryland tracks would do the same thing. They would shut down. So they would combine forces and the horses from the one track population would be taken in and be the horses that would run at the new track. 
you've got a couple obvious ways to go here. And you know why it's never going to happen? Because just like Randy said uh, before about common sense, it it's, it's, makes too much common sense. There should be a circuit of Delaware Park should get involved in a circuit with Maryland. And I also think parks should get into a circuit with Mammoth, where parks in Maryland don't run during the summer months. The field sizes at the tracks that do run would, would balloon up. The quality of racing would be much better. Um, and you'd have, you know, really other than the kind of the inconvenience of shipping from one track to the other. But on top of that, I advocated that the tracks get together and provide free vans for the horsemen to go back and forth between the two tracks. Also to take care of the breeders. Suppose you were going to have a three month Delaware Park meeting that combines with Maryland horsemen. There's no reason why you can't run Maryland bred races at Delaware Park. Um, and these tracks are, 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 you know, putting out these fields with, with five, six horses. It's, it's hurting everybody. And, and not only that, I also think the purses would go up because if you have all these purses come from slot machines. So all of a sudden you have a big pie. It's worth $10 million. If you cut it up into 10 pieces, it's worth a million dollars. If you cut it up into five pieces, it's worth $2 million. That casino money is not going anywhere. And if it's spread among fewer races, the purses would go up. I don't see any drawback to this whatsoever, other than a little bit of the inconvenience factor. But having said that, why am I even bringing this up? Because it makes common sense and it's not going to happen. However, people in Maryland are, are actually talking about this. This is where it might happen with the, the new group taking over the Maryland Jockey Club from Stronach. We'll see, we'll see about that. But, you know, racing was a lot more fun when we used to do it this way. Um, I mean, I, I don't really know what to say. I think it's, it's basically all the tracks want a big slice of the pie, but nobody wants to give up their little piece of pie to help somebody else. They're owned by different entities. And that is where you hit the nail on the head. Now, Maryland, now owned by the state, may have a fighting chance with Corey Johnson. Um, but no one wants to give up their slice of the pie. And if you've got horses from Maryland shipping to Delaware, right? Delaware is going to take the biggest slice of the pie. But yet the people in Maryland still have to pay for the running of their racetrack because they're not going to move to Delaware. So then you have the costs of the racetrack and the maintenance and the stabling and everything that that racetrack or state has to cover when Delaware Park is garnering most of the laurels. So it's just a question of who wants to give up their slice of the pie. And we've seen it time and time again. We don't play nice together. We really don't. Nobody wants to give up their slice of the pie. So I don't know how it can be alleviated, how it can work. I Got no idea. You make up good points, really good points, but trying to get different entities and different states to work together, I can't see how it can happen unless someone comes in and says, hey, Delaware, hey, Maryland, here's $10 million for you and $10 million for you. Now try and get this shit figured out. I don't, I, that's the only way I can see it working. Zoe, all good points, but I do think this is going to happen eventually in Maryland. It's Corey Johnson, who Randy knows real well, is a very good in Maryland. Uh, yes, yes, I racetrack executive. He Maryland. knows how to get things done, and he is on the record saying we cannot sustain this kind of year-round racing schedule. So that's the one to keep your eye on. It, yeah. it, it could either merge with Colonial or Delaware, but I do think maybe in 2026 that could happen. Well, the historical problem obviously has been just as Zoe said. I mean, there's no one looking out for the long term <clears throat> best interests of the sport of horse racing in general. They're all looking at the bottom line for their little individual fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. And so many tracks like uh, the tracks in West Virginia that want to run that want to run year round, the tracks in Pennsylvania parks that want to run year round. So many of these places say, okay. If we run year round, our average handle per day will drop. But at the end of the year, we've run so many racing days that our total profit will be higher. So we'll just look at what we're doing here and we'll get make more profit at the end of the year. And that's all we care about. Right. Uh, you know, I, but between New York and New Jersey and Maryland and West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Virginia now, I mean, there's just, there's too much racing. That's just the bottom line. If there was a commissioner in horse racing 
we talked about this ad nauseum and there's never going to be one, but if there was a Roger Goodell or a Silver or somebody like that sitting in an office uh, who could help make decisions with major racetrack owners around the country and could say, all right, we're going to change the racing dates here. We're going to cut all these racing dates down. These racetracks won't be running on top of each other. Uh, maybe at the most two at one, you know, that would be perfect. But I, I agree with you, Bill. I think it's probably going to happen. Uh, as we discussed last week on a limited basis, mm -hmm. uh, with involving Maryland. Uh, but as far as a widespread basis in the Northeast, I'm still pretty skeptical. How yeah, about we and, figure and, out post times first? Oh, yeah, good luck. I mean, <laughs> we can't figure that out. Races running on top of each other. How? I mean, yeah, yeah I don't know. <laughs> but um, just to, to throw some more numbers behind my um, uh, my debate, there are right now in Colonial Opens on July 11th, and that's a good meet, by the way. Um, there are going to be eight racetracks run within 400 miles It'll all be racing at one time. So, you know, that's just not sustainable. So we'll see what happens. So more racing news involving race tracks. Um, this came out yesterday. Naira announced that for the once Belmont is rebuilt uh, during the winter months, all racing will be conducted on the synthetics track that they're installing, the Tapedic track. And I think that's a really good idea. I mean, it's first of all, it's the safest surface possible. We know that. I think it'll probably convince some trainers not to send their grass horses to Gulfstream because they could run on the synthetic in New York in the winter. And it's, uh, you, know, you know, you won't have to worry about the inclement weather nearly as much uh, so far as, you know, big rainstorms or snowstorms or whatnot. You know, I'm, I'm sure the horsemen probably aren't real happy about this because, you know, they don't like get any uh, curveballs thrown at them. But, um, you know, no, we don't want to pee to at, at in, you know, in the summer in Belmont, the summer in Saratoga. But in the middle of February, when, you know, the best race on the card is a, a allowance race and there's five New York red races, I think this is absolutely the way to go. And uh, I think they, they're going to actually improve the quality of racing because they'll have bigger fields than they would uh, or, uh, ordinarily on just dirt racing. Yeah. They, they need both. Oh, sorry. They need both. I mean, the horsemen aren't happy at all. I've spoken to a couple. You've got people that leave their horses there in the winter. That's their bread and butter. Just dirt racing in the winter when the big wigs have gone out of town. Some of those... Um, Horses can't stand up on the synthetic. And yes, it's a good idea from a safety standpoint and the weather that they get, but it's not going to fly. And then what's going to happen with the graded stakes with points towards the Kentucky Derby? They said three months, right? Which three months are we talking about? Because in February, in January, you got the Jerome. That's points to the Derby. You're going to run that on to Peter. And then you have the Bassander. And then you have the Withers. In February, that's 20 points. The Gotham is March the 3rd. That's 50 points. How's that going to work? There's no way they're going to have just to Peter racing. They're going to have to have at least some dirt and give the trainers a choice. Well, well they, say, they say that's not their intention, so we'll, we'll see. So, honestly, the best thing for the horses would be to have no winter racing at all in New York and let the horses rest, but... For reasons that Zoe pointed out, that's not going to happen. It's not politically feasible. The trainers, the owners, they want a place to run in the winter months. They need it financially. Uh, and so, you know, that's out of the question. The reason why this is happening to begin with, the switch to Tapita, is because Naira wants to standardize its dirt racing surfaces between Saratoga and Belmont and Aqueduct. They want them to be exactly the same. And they want them to be all in the Saratoga dirt model because Saratoga has uh, the safest racing surface statistically of the three. Well, Saratoga's dirt summer has a clay base, not aqueduct in the winter, not Belmont coming up in the winter because a clay base is more prone to freezing in the winter months. And so that's kind of a no-go if you're going to run over the winter. So that's why instead of... Um, you know, in, 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 instead of dealing with that, they they want a surface that is impervious to freezing, that, that they, it's safer statistically. So that's why they're doing the tapita, so they can save their dirt surface for the warmer months and make it exactly like Saratoga surface. So there's definitely no way that 
then they can race on the dirt in the winter if that's what they're going ahead with. Right. Right. There would be a lot of frozen track interruptions. Yes. Yeah. Do want to remind you that the TDN Writers Room is also brought to you by XBTV. You can catch all of their works on XBTV.com, including many from Saratoga. I'll be there next weekend for the whole summer, which I'm delighted about. But right now we're going to take a look at Mindframe and Tuscan Sky this past Saturday at Saratoga. That's Mindframe on the outside, working an easy 50 and four in his first work back since his runner-up finish in the Belmont Stakes. His work partner, Tuscan Sky, is a gray on the inside, and he is back for his first work since winning the Naira Betts Pegasus Stakes on June the 15th at Monmouth. According to Todd Pletcher, the pair, along with everyone else, is currently pointing to the July 20th Haskell State at Monmouth. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. TD and Riders Room also brought to you by our friends at West Point Thoroughbreds. What a month of June West Point had. 25 starters overall that they owned, either solo or in partnership. 12 winners, great Churchill meetings spread across a lot of other tracks as well. And the stakes action for West Point continues this weekend, Friday night at Prairie Meadows. They've got a card with four $100,000 stakes races. West Point is active with Jackson Traveler in the Iowa Sprint and Happy Am I in the Sailorville at Woodbine, Gal and Arush goes in the grade three Hendry stakes. And then Sunday, it's Dell Cap Day at Delaware Park. And on the undercard of the Dell Cap, as always, is the Robert B. Dick Memorial Stakes, mile and three eighths on the turf. And West Point will have both Parnak, who won the Flower Bowl at Saratoga last year, was third in the Robert Dick a year ago, and Atomic Blonde, who's coming off that mile and a half win in the Kirtana Stakes at Churchill Downs. So West Point set up for a big weekend this weekend as well. To learn more about how you can get involved, you can go to westpointtb.com. And that's a wrap on this week's show. We thank you all for tuning in. I want to thank my team, Randy Moss and Zoe Cadman, along with our special guest, Ned Toffee, the Green Group Guest of the Week, and the people who work so hard behind the scenes to make this happen, Katie Petruniak, Anthony and Alila Rocca. See you next week. Thanks for tuning us in. Thank you.